Good evening. It's been called bandit country and with reason. South Armagh over the years has, even in Northern Ireland terms, had more than its share of violence and lawlessness. It's a risky place to be if you're a British soldier, but the army makes it risky for other people, argue local nationalists. They complain of army violence, harassment and victimisation. Do the soldiers behave sometimes as badly as the terrorists they confront? Here's what local people have been telling Brendan O'Brien. This boy run across the road in very bad looking temper. I can remember that, very wicked looking. And just put the gun into my mouth and says, I blew the head off you there for Jesus. Was he army or are you saying? He was an army man. One fella in particular, he came, he was hysterical. He came at me with a gun pointing like that. And I'm roaring and shouting to get out of the car. Get out of the car. That's all he kept shouting. And he never stopped until he was above on top of the bonnet of the car, pointing the gun in my head in the, in the car. So uh, I said that you're in the south. Just at that same instant, Fable says I'm hit. And he fell down. He landed on my leg. And I knew he was in a bad way because he says I'm hit, I'm hit. And allow me, allow me, that's all he could say. Like. I knew he was too bad when he was saying that. Like. Complaints against the British Army are often about matters of life and death. These soldiers in Cross McGlen, under constant terrorist threat, could no doubt make the same complaint. But in this border country, as elsewhere, soldiers are obliged to uphold the law, maintain the peace, win the confidence of the whole community. Today, tonight, has been to South Armagh to examine claims of more dubious and dangerous actions by the army. Reputable voices say this simply wins recruits for the IRA. According to the RUC, the IRA threat in three police districts of South Armagh is such that no mobile police patrol has been out in 15 years. So the predominant security force presence in these parts is the army. While much of its movement is confined to the air, there persists in South Armagh a body of allegations of serious misconduct by soldiers on the ground. And there persists the view that almost no complaints are satisfactorily resolved. Today, tonight, examine such allegations. We were filming at Cross McGlen's Health Centre by last minute appointment. While army helicopters flew above, a vehicle swiftly passed by. It turned out to be an IRA attack on one of the helicopters. It was the third helicopter attack in South Armagh in a year, the second hit. In the same period, there were six explosions or mortar attacks, seven ammunition finds and other shootings where one soldier and one policeman were killed. No one was arrested for any of these incidents. The RUC admit that the capacity of the IRA in South Armagh has not diminished in 20 years. It's against this background that the army deals with the ordinary law-abiding people of South Armagh. According to the army, they received 200 formal complaints in the north last year, and more the year before. They say about half are denied, 20% substantiated, and that all complainants get a reply giving the result. Two months ago, Father Malachy Conlon met the commanding officer and brigadier of the Marines at Dramad Barracks. Along with Seamus Mallon, Father Conlon left a batch of written complaints against the army by local men, some alleging threats to kill. Well, I, I believe that, that uh, activities such as, uh, as outlined in, in, in these complaints um, is one of the greatest recruitment agents for the provisional IRA. Uh, I have repeatedly and will continue to uh, reject totally the violence of all paramilitaries. But I, I would believe that the institutional violence of both the Army and the RUC are one of the, the, the sickest sources of violence in our country. Patrick Cunningham drives the school bus at Cullihanna. He is also school caretaker and is known to have no political connections. 
Patrick Cunningham's complaint was one of those given to the army by Father Conlon. He says that at a checkpoint last November, a soldier put a gun in his mouth and threatened to shoot. Patrick Cunningham's case casts serious doubt on the official version that all complaints are rigorously investigated and the results given in writing. It was close to darkness when Patrick drove to a checkpoint at Sheetram Crossroads near Cullihanna. He says he was first questioned by a policeman and stopped within a few yards by a soldier. There had been another car in front. I saw I couldn't get past the car, so I stopped. And uh, after leaving the policeman a few yards up the road, I, my window in the diving side was still down, hadn't it screwed up. And just as I stopped, this boy ran across the road in very bad looking temper. I can remember that, very wicked looking. And just put the gun into my mouth and said, I'd blow the head off you there for Jesus. Was he army or are you saying? He was an army man. Just show me uh, how he did it. Well, I can remember just uh, when I heard the, the voice speaking, I could just remember turning around, you know, to look out. And I could just remember just putting it right to my mouth. I can remember that. The gun? Yeah. And did he keep it there or what happened? Well, I don't remember now. Quite honest, uh, once I felt that, uh, I can't remember anything else. Maria Carraher had been driving a car close behind Patrick Cunningham. Two of her brothers were shot, one of them fatally, in controversial circumstances some weeks later. On this occasion, she recalls hearing screams from the car in front. I got out of the car and I went over to the car and uh, I saw a man inside it and he was in hysterics, very poor, very badly shaken up, you know. So uh, I realised, I recognised him after a few seconds and I asked him, I says, Paddy, what's wrong? Are you okay? He says, oh, Marie, I'm shot, I'm shot. I says, Paddy, are you okay? What can I do for you? He says, oh, Marie, he says, they put the gun to my head and they said they were going to shoot me. So I lifted my head out of the car and I says, I says to the soldier who was there, I says, what's wrong with this man? I says, what has left him in this state? And uh, they just seemed to have no idea of what was wrong with him at all. So um, the policeman, I asked him, and he was the same, didn't know. At Cully Hanna, the parish priest, Father Moran, was called to the scene at Sheetram Crossroads. Patrick Cunningham lives in the parochial house. Father Moran says he found Patrick shaking and sweating. Patrick was brought by ambulance to Daisy Hill Hospital in Newry after a wait of about 15 minutes. He says he can remember nothing until he awoke there. Says, what's wrong with me, doctor? Well, he says you have been severely shocked, he says. Uh, the army, you must have got a... We don't know what has happened to you, but he says you, you, have a very, you have a very bad state of shock, he says. And that's your problem. Back at the scene of the incident, Maria Carraher recalls questioning a soldier and policeman about Patrick's state of hysteria. He asked me, um, does he take fits like this often? And I says, no, not that I know of at all. They seem to think that, you know, this is just some fit that he had taken and it wasn't any, anything, you know, to do with them. They had done nothing to... Did they just call it a fit? Or did they mention anything else? No, they didn't mention anything else. They just said, you know, just asked, was it a fit he was taking? Father Moran got the full story from Patrick the next morning. A day after that, he went to Newton Hamilton RUC station and complained. But Father Moran declined to make a formal complaint, saying it was futile to do so. When Patrick Cunningham's formal written complaint was given to the army in January among this batch, it hit an extraordinary snag straight away. Seamus Mallon and Father Conlon were, in effect, told that Patrick Cunningham's story was untrue. Well, they knew about it, obviously, because they, they were able to say that, in their opinion, he was an epileptic and that he had suffered an epileptic fit at the road uh, check. Uh, my understanding of the situation was that a soldier jumped out of a hedge in a very, very excited state, that he opened the door of the car and that he put uh, his gun into Mr. Cunningham's mouth. Now, either this man had an epileptic fit, and I understand that there was no, no history of epilepsy there whatsoever. Uh, if he had such a, a, a turn, then the medical evidence will confirm that. I asked what evidence did he have uh, of such a fit, and um, he didn't reply. 
And had you heard this business of an epileptic fit before that? No, that was the first I, I'd heard of, of epilepsy. You have a history of epilepsy? No, thanks be to God, no history of any diseases so far, anyhow. No. Had anybody mentioned it to you anywhere along the line? That you may have suffered an epileptic fit? No, nobody ever said that to me. I never, well, I never, never told to me anyhow. No, never was. That's the first time I've heard. Patrick's long-standing doctor gave today tonight a statement. Dr. O'Hanlon said Patrick Cunningham had no history of epilepsy. We inquired at Daisy Hill Hospital, also with Patrick's consent. They said that on the night in question, Patrick Cunningham was solely treated for shock. The question of epilepsy did not arise. The RUC told today tonight that the complaint of Patrick Cunningham had been resolved locally with Father Moran. They said he'd agreed a gun had not been put in Patrick Cunningham's mouth. Father Moran declined to be interviewed, but in a statement he said, I categorically deny that I at any time agreed to withdraw the allegation that a gun had been put into Patrick Cunningham's mouth. The question of withdrawing the allegation did not arise at all, either with the RUC or the Army. But did you agree at any stage later that a gun had not been put in your mouth? Oh, I did not. Nobody ever came to me to ask me anything. No military personnel or RUC or no one ever contacted me from it ever happened. I, I believe that a, a criminal offence has taken place. Um, and I want uh, the incident investigated and the culprits, those uh, that have been guilty, brought to justice. Simply that. Because I believe in, in a general way that if, if a RUC or army personnel are allowed to move around the, the country here in South Armagh and do what they like without uh, being accountable to the law, then we have two sets of terrorists. He said. This man's complaint was also amongst those presented to the army by Seamus Mallon and Father Conlon. We'll call him Patrick. He says he was stopped in darkness on Palmer's Mill Road by three soldiers. It was 6.30 p.m. Tuesday the 8th of January. He says a soldier called him a murdering cunt, telling him to get out. And what happened then, Patrick? The soldier came up to me and pushed the gun into my chest and backed me back towards the back of the car and uh, said there's only the two of us here tonight, I'm going to waste you. And he said that? Yeah. You heard it clearly, clearly, yeah. did you? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then? Then he said, open up the boot. I opened up the boot. He said, put all this stuff out on the road. And then he said, did you hear what happened today? And I never answered him. And he said, answer me when I speak to you. And uh, I still didn't answer him. And he said, we're not too pleased about what happened today. What happened was an IRA culvert bomb exploding on the Newton Hamilton Dundalk Road shortly after a school bus passed by. It injured three soldiers and two civilians and caused widespread damage. You think he's a tough man up here, he said. But we'll show you that we are tougher than you think. And uh, he said, he said, you're one of these boys that's doing the shooting and blowing up at people. He says, and you know who the rest of them are. He says, tell us who they are. And I didn't answer him. And he said, answer me when I speak to you. So I still said nothing. And uh, he said, what do you think of the situation in Cully Hanna? And I said, I don't think too much of all that. And uh, he asked me where did I drink? And I said, yeah, all over the place. And he said, do you drink in that late and easy place in Cully Hanna? And I said, I did. And uh, he says, will you tell your mates, he said, that we'll be over for you and a few of them some night. And we'll not just give you a wee tap on the face, he says, we'll do a lot of use by And uh, he says, uh, we're checking you out on the radio now. And if we find anything out about you or anybody belong, he said, you're a dead man here the night. But the incident he was talking about, the uh, three soldiers could have been killed in that bomb. Yes. Isn't that right? Well, supposedly. It's, it's not confirmed. No. So perhaps, he was justified in feeling a bit hyped that night, do you think? No, I wouldn't agree with that. If, if he's carrying out a professional job, that's no way to, to treat anybody. And what's your own attitude 